And welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us for this re reproductive health with sickle cell disease with Dr. Nunez. Dr. Nunez is a board certified physician specializing in pediatric hematology and, and oncology at the Haley Center for Children's Cancer and Blood Disorders at Orlando Health Arnold Palmer Hospital for Children. She cares for infants, children, and young adults, and her clinical interests include non-malignant hematology, sickle cell disease, platelet disorders, vascular malformations, and more. Dr. Nunez earned her medical degree from Pontifica Universidad. I'm sorry, I do not speak Spanish. It was in the Dominican Republic. Graduating with honors, she completed her internship and residency at Lincoln Medical and Mental Health Center in the Bronx and a fellowship in pediatric hematology oncology at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences College of Medicine in Arkansas's Children's Hospital in Little Rock. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Nuyes. Dr. Nuyes, did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes, that's correct. Yay. <laughs> Hi, thank you for being here and for presenting to us. Thank you so much. Thank you, you guys, all the organizers, especially Carla, for inviting me to spend some time with you this morning. I'm very excited. Um, we're going to be talking this morning about um, what I think are some of the highlights of the challenges that individuals with sickle cell disease face in their reproductive health. Um, we can go to the next slide. So today, my goal is to educate all the individuals that are joining us this morning that live with sickle cell disease about how this can impact their reproductive health. Um, I'm going to discuss just how we can address as doctors some of the symptoms that you might be being experiencing, um, present to you guys what are some of those fertility options that are available out there. And if there's any providers there, hopefully, I can also increase some awareness in the group about why is it so important that we discuss these topics um, with our patients. Um, next. Next slide. I don't know who has the control. Oh, I do. Okay. Well, um, and my only disclosure is that I'm a pediatric hematologist, like you mentioned, so I'm not a specialized doctor in adult care or pregnancy care, um, gynecologist or urologist. So there are some of the things that I'll be presenting to you, hoping that um, I just start that spark um, in patients and providers and let you know that what are the options and what are the things available and hope that um, you guys can start those discussions with your doctors and, and get better better um, help for yourselves. Next. Um, the slides are not showing well. Is it okay if I just share my screen? Can you see that? Can you see my screen? Uh, we see a screen, but not your screen. It's the person that's still sharing the screen. Okay. Can you see my screen now? No, give us one second. We still I'm see sorry, the it's just that the, the ones that you were presenting were not showing that well. Give us one second and uh, we'll get we'll get it fixed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No there we go. We see your screen now, Doctor Everett. Oh, you mean? Okay. Perfect. Um, can you still see that? Yep. All right. Um, okay, so um, I think we are all very familiar with sickle cell disease, but I just want to highlight something with this slide. Um, sickle cell disease is a lot more complex than just anemia, like some people think about it. Um, we know that because of the red blood cells being um, deformed, yes, they are not going to survive too much 
floating around our body and they're going to break apart easily but they can also damage the blood vessels on the inside. Um, they, of course, we know cause obstruction of how good that blood flow. Um, they can also induce inflammation in our body. They can trigger our coagulation system. So there is a lot that um, undergoes um, in this patient's bodies um, every day, all day. Um, and that's why so many organs of their body can get damaged from having sickle cell disease. Um, thankfully, within the last 30 years or so though, um, the mortality of patients with sickle cell disease have improved significantly. Um, and it's because we understand the disease better, we've come up with better diagnostic things, we're able to catch up things earlier in the disease process and we have some better treatment options. But nowadays, more than 93% of the children that have sickle cell disease um, in countries like ours are surviving. They are living through their reproductive years and even longer than that. Um, so to me, that, that tells me that it's very necessary that we have this discussion, that we address reproductive health um, with the patients, with the parents, um, not just during childhood, uh, which is what I typically do, but also when they're adults um, during their pregnancies. And we need to be better at educating our families and patients and also supporting them um, through these processes. Um, so what is reproductive health? Let's just start there, right? So um, I have an image here that shows what are the reproductive organs or what are the parts of our body that helps us and that are involved in our reproduction. But anything that affects um, the fertility, the pregnancy, or the sexual health of a person should be considered that it's part of their uh, reproductive health. Um, so of course, sickle cell disease, like we saw, can affect any of these organs. So that's how your reproductive health um, can be affected. Um, and, and that's how individuals living with sickle cell disease have a lot of challenges. Um, but it is important to remember, just like other things with sickle cell disease, it doesn't mean that every single child, uh, men and women, are going to experience um, this challenging um, things. Um, just like any other sickle cell related complications, how severe or what gets impacted on the individual is going to be very different from person to person. Um, and um, it's also important to highlight that, yes, your fertility can be challenged, but that doesn't necessarily mean that individuals with sickle cell disease are infertile. And fertility specifically is defined by the World Health Organization as trying to conceive and not being able to do that um, for a period of 12 months. So for many years, our biggest attention as doctors has been making sure you individuals with sickle cell disease understand um, that this is a genetic disorder, that this is an inherited thing, that you can um, pass it on to your children. And, and we just pretty much said, and there's explore available options. Um, but to be honest, we didn't pay much attention about what are those options and what are the things we can do to change um, this um, or not. And I think that over the years, since that was the main focus, we've created a big gap in knowledge in our patients. So I feel like there's a lot of young adults um, who understand that genetic part of sickle cell very well, but it's not clear about what are the options, what are the things, what changes should I be expecting and how I can um, change those or help myself through those or ask for help or advocacy. Um, and we know that by talking to our families in practice, we know that by hearing from our community, but there's also been studies like scientifically, we've been looking at this and, and we know that um, our families, our patients um, don't have the knowledge, to, the knowledge that they need. Um, this is an example of a group of investigators that actually send surveys um, to adolescents and young adults and the parents of adolescents um, with sickle cell disease. Um, and they ask questions about what do you know about um, reproductive health and how is your desire of having kids? And what they found was that having a biologic 
child was very important for all the individuals, but less than 25% of those that actually filled that survey felt like they knew something about how fertility gets affected or how the reproductive health gets affected, or even things about what birth control options they could or shouldn't do, um, how medications affect their reproduction. Um, and then there's this another group that actually survey uh, pediatric patients um, and their families um, and uh, young adolescents and adults. And they were asking about contraception, specifically individuals with sickle cell disease. And they really found that they didn't have much information about um, what contraceptives work better or not. Um, they didn't feel to know much about what the long term or what the longer um, things to use to prevent contraception. And they actually found that majority of young adults were having unintended pregnancy because they didn't know what the best options for those are. So to me, this is a clear thing that as clinicians, we need to make this a priority. We need to be better at teaching um, our families, our patients about these problems and inc including birth control options and fertility risks. Um, so let's get to it, okay? Um, I'm gonna discuss what are those challenges for you guys today and, and, and um, we'll take it from there, okay? So I'm gonna start with females, okay? Um, how can sequel cell disease affect the female fertility? Well, let's start with the menstrual cycles. We know that if you have sickle cell disease, um, you are gonna have a delayed start of your menstrual cycles, typically by one to two years, which is what delayed menarche refers to, okay? So yes, you're gonna have menstrual cycles, but they are gonna start later in your life compared to other healthy kids your age. Um, we still are not 100% sure if, if all individuals that have sickle cell disease have regular or irregular menstrual cycles because the, what we have out there, some people report that you are, you know, most of the girls are having irregular cycles, but some others report that your menstrual cycles are actually okay. And when I mean regular, I mean how frequently you get it um, and for how many days you're bleeding. But we know that it starts late. Um, and we know that you guys um, have a lot of pain when you have your menstrual cycles, which is what this menorrhea means. And some adolescents are having just bad menstrual cramps, uh, but some um, individuals, adolescents and young females report that you actually start to have a pain crisis around the time of when you're having your menstrual cycles. Most of the reports say that um, Females can actually differentiate this as actually a pain crisis, like a vasoclusive crisis versus this is a bad menstrual cramp. But both things happen um, and both things should be addressed and we should prepare our young girls um, to be able to tell us about this and how we can help you guys with this. Um, the other thing that we should know is that um, your ovarian reserve is diminished. And I'm gonna explain this a little bit more. So ovarian reserve means how many eggs can your ovary provide through your life that are gonna eventually you know, be able to get fertilized and convert into a baby. Um, so in healthy individuals, as we age, we know that the amount of eggs that we can get from our ovaries decreases over uh, time, um, but in females that have sickle cell disease, those numbers go down, they decrease even faster. So um, we know that around age 25 to 30 years of age or so, you already have less amount of eggs um, to, to utilize compared to healthy individuals. And we think this is because of the ovary getting affected from the sickle cell, that it it, it just doesn't work as well in general. Um, and some think that also hydroxyurea, if you are on hydroxyurea, that that number can actually be even lower, uh, but we don't have strong evidence still to suggest that. So we still recommend hydroxyurea, but I think maybe that's something that we need to mention when we talk about the medication, but it's not 100% certain. There's people who say they find evidence that yes, but other investigators say that they find evidence that 
we don't. So I think we need to keep looking into that. But you have less amount of eggs um, earlier in life compared to healthy individuals. Um, and then premature ovarian failure can also happen. And that is that, again, normally as we age, women go through menopause and that's when your ovaries are not producing hormones as well. Uh, but this can also happen earlier if you have sickle cell disease. Um, and again, there are some people who think hydroxyurea might change that, but we still need more information to be able to say yes or no. Um, so in general, I would say that your reproductive age, it's shorter than healthy individuals. You're starting to have menstrual cycles later in life. Um, as you grow older, when you're still a young adult, you already have less amount of eggs that could be ready for um, helping you have a child, um, but also how well your ovaries work. Um, it's a little shorter in life. So we, I think we should explain that and you should all be aware of that when you're deciding a plan, um, having a family. Um, how about when you get pregnant? Let's say you make that decision, um, you already decided that you wanna have a, a biological child and that you, or you are planning to or became pregnant. Well, we know that pregnancy in any healthy female, it, it, it's still a, a, an impact in your body. It, it demands a lot more from your body. Um, and you are at risk of having blood clots um, and you know, other complications like anemia normally happen when you, when you have a pregnancy. Um, so if we combine just the normal risks of a pregnancy with now you have sickle cell disease and you also have a lot of other issues going on in your, in your system, well, pregnancy can be considered to be a higher risk in sickle cell disease. Um, and unfortunately, there's a slight high risk of mortality. Um, so what are some of the complications? Well, you might have anemia as a baseline and that anemia can get worse. So sometimes um, females might need more frequent blood transfusions. Um, they can experience more pain crisis during pregnancy or more uh, acute chest syndrome episodes. Um, the blood pressure can go up and when your blood pressure go up and you're pregnant and your kidneys are not working well, that's what preeclampsia means. Um, so you can have more of that if you have sickle cell disease. Um, and the reason why that's important is because if you have high blood pressure, you might not be able to deliver enough blood to your baby. So your baby can also have consequences for that. Um, we know that there is a higher risk of losing pregnancies or miscarriages or even having babies earlier than their due date, which would be preterm labor in individuals that have sickle cell disease. Um, and um, for many years, we there is strong evidence to suggest that if you were in hydroxyurea and you got pregnant, that hydroxyurea can actually affect your baby. There's some investigations that are coming out suggesting that the doses that we use might not really cause that. It might be when we use hydroxyurea for other diseases. Um, but I think we need to consider that. If you're in hydroxyurea, what's the risk for your baby? And should we adjust your treatment based on that or not? Um, because of the blood flow, not, blood flow not being great, then the babies um, of Pregnant ladies that have sickle cell disease can also be a little smaller in size, which is what fetal growth restrictions uh, refers to. And also remember, if you're sickle cell disease, you are at higher risk of starting your coagulation cascade. Pregnancies can also do that. So there is higher risk of developing blood clots, and that can be blood clots in your legs, um, but sometimes blood clots that also go to your lungs. So definitely. Pregnancy, if you have sickle cell disease, should be considered of high risk, meaning that you need special attention, special monitoring um, to make sure that we, we, we support you through that. Um, how about boys? Um, well, we know that also in boys, their development um, of puberty can come a little later, also by about one to two years later. And when we talk about Puberty in girls, we always think about menstruation. In boys, we should be thinking about developing the facial hair, um, 
how the testicles change in size, how the penis changes in size. Um, so that happens a little later also in boys if you have sickle cell disease. Um, and hypogonadism just means about how where your hormones are, how much hormones you develop that help you through, go through that puberty, um, and also about the sperm production. Uh, so sometimes the hormones in boys can be lower um, if you have sickle cell disease um, and you don't produce enough hormones and it takes you a little longer to, to get to those strong male characteristics. Um, so it, it, about 25% of boys may have issues with their um, hormones, like the testosterone being a little low. Um, but again, it's still one of those things that we need to learn a lot more to kind of be able to give them more um, information about. Um, about the function um, of the organs uh, in the reproductive part of the male, specifically the penis. I'm just gonna touch briefly because I know we had a discussion yesterday and one coming up that's gonna talk a little bit later, but remember that if a boy is having priapism, which is those prolonged painful erections, um, then that can lead to erectile dysfunction. It means that the penis get damaged and then it doesn't work as well. Um, and the numbers that I have there is like what percent of patients could actually have that if you have sickle cell disease. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to highlight is that in boys, the sperm quality can be um, affected by sickle cell disease. And sometimes it is that um, how much sperm you produce can be less or how well those um, that sperm moves around and the quality of it in general can be affected from having sickle cell disease. And it's not because if your testicle gets affected, then the quality of the sperm that comes out um, can also not be the best. Um, and I know that some of those numbers that I have there are pretty high, like how many people can actually experience that. But remember, there's still a lot of men and a lot of boys with sickle cell disease that can father children. Um, so again, we're not saying that these boys or um, males are infertile, it's just that it can change some, okay? And even though I'm telling you all these things, well, as doctors, like I, I brought up, there's still a lot that we need to learn. Um, to understand better why these things are happening and if we can change that from happening, but also how do we teach our patients or families about this? How do we give you guys advice about this? Um, again, just from talking to the community, we know that that happens, but also that has been studied and published. Um, there's also been a lot of surveys that have been done to pediatric providers like I am and doctors that take care of adult patients with sickle cell disease. And I'm just going to read over some highlights from some of these studies. So we know that majority of us actually talk about um, reproductive health or menstrual cycles or how medications can affect um, but we don't do that great about what to do about that problem. Um, we don't do it great as um, giving you guys birth control if you're a female or teaching a male what are the options that are out there. And when the doctors have reported that they do actually give their, their patients some um, support with that, what they use is very different from doctor to doctor. Um, and this was another survey again that said, yes, we do a lot of counseling, we do actually do some, some teaching, but this one actually said that when we did that, it was not because we knew you had sickle cell disease, it was mostly because, oh, now this patient is sexually active, so we feel like we needed to do something about it. So there's still a lot that we as doctors need to learn, but also there's, there's still a lot that needs to be done to help us all get together and be better at this. Like I think all the patients, wherever you are, you deserve to have the right information about it. So we need to make it a little more standard and, and we don't have that right now. There's nothing that tells us as doctors um, that treat patients with sickle cell disease, this is when you need to start talking about it and this is what are the things that you need to talk about. Um, so now we know what are the issues or some of those issues, what can we do about those? So 
If you're experiencing any of these symptoms, talk to your doctor because there should always be an option to help you through this. For example, if you are a, a, a girl and you're having a lot of menstrual pain, then we can do some, some pain interventions, but there's also um, some hormones that we can use that, that have proven that help with menstrual pain in girls. So we should know about this and we should come up with a good pain plan that fits what your experience is. Is it, is it more menstrual cramps? Is it more pain crisis? And how to prepare for that um, and make it better. Um, if you became pregnant, then you need to get the best care you can, right? Um, so we want to make sure that you're getting monitoring of your blood counts frequently, that you're always well hydrated, if you need a transfusion, if you need pain medicines. Um, and when you're ready to deliver, make sure we, you know we're also doing as much as you deserve to have a healthier or less complicated pregnancy if we can. Um, but also once you had a baby and you're, if you're on any sickle cell um, modifying medication, we have a lot of new um, medicines that we're being using lately. Make sure that you talk about how could that affect your baby if it goes through the breast milk or not, should you do anything differently about feeding your child? Um, so keep those things in mind if you're breastfeeding. And also, we remember premature uterine failure is pretty much like getting menopause earlier. So if you're an adult female and you think you're experiencing some of those symptoms, like hot flashes, dryness, um, and things like that, talk to your providers. Um, I don't think that's something we can slow down, unfortunately, but if we need to go to hormonal therapy or not, I think we need to explore those options. Um, if you're a boy, right, um, uh, remember, even though the sexual maturation is delayed by maybe one and a half or two years, typically you're going to eventually develop those sexual characteristics. But if it's been longer than that, make sure, you, you know, we're addressing that as well. Um, for priapism, we're going to learn a little more later, but make sure you're getting help. Make sure you know how to identify it and what to do if it's going on. Um, and if the problem is with erectile dysfunction, like you're um, a, a male and, and your penis is, doesn't seem to be working that great, say something about it, because we should be able to at least discuss some options and provide help. Is it hormones to help with your desire? Is it other interventions? Let's talk about those things, okay? Um, I'm going to focus a little bit about um, contraception for women um, or young adults or adolescents. Um, so I think just like any other individual, you should have access to proper contraception, um, but we want to make sure that we're doing it in a safe manner because, again, just from sickle cell, you can have increased risk of clots. Um, we should all have um, availability to that and what gets used, it's really going to depend on your age, on where you're located in the world, what complications you particularly have been having from sickle cell disease. But remember that majority of, of females with sickle cell disease are having unintended pregnancies. So I think we need to change that. Um, if you're a hydroxyurea, remember to talk about your provider, how if that has to be changed. But basically, um, back in 2004, the World Health Organization um, made recommendations for females that have sickle cell disease, what should be safe or not, um, for contraception, for birth control. And then in 2006, the American College of Obstetricians said, you know what, we agree with what the World Health Organization, Organization has said about this. Um, and what they actually said is that it, us as provider always think that if you have a a birth control that has hormones that include estrogen, then, then you are at higher risk of forming clots. So we, we thought a lot about, well, if you have sickle cell, maybe that's not the best thing to do because now you're having two things together that can make you have clots. But what they actually said is that they put those, those medicines as the level two. So that means that in theory, that risk is there, but in the reality, we think it's still safe to use. Um, and then the progesterone pill, which is the one that doesn't have estrogen or the mini pill, they said, well, those that don't have any contraindications. 
So their option is to take pills. Um, and if you don't want to use pills, then there's other things as implants, um, like the ones that go under your arm. Um, so the implants are just, um, um, you know, like a little device that get put there. Um, they're small, they're flexible, they go under the skin and they can provide long-term contraception um, so for a couple of years. Um, it's safe to use intrauterine devices or the IUD. Um, with the implants, the bleeding can get a little irregular, so some girls don't like it because of that. Um, the IUD should be safe. Um, infection risk and other things, of course, you need to talk about with your doctor, um, but it should be safe to use. And of course, there's a lot of other barrier methods um, that you can consider and that should also be safe. And you can use those in combination with pills and other things or not. Um, so essentially there are options available. So talk to your doctor about those. How about when you need hormonal therapy, not for contraception or for birth control, but actually because of transgender? And that's a scenario that, um, of course, it's there. We should also be able to address. So some individuals that are transgender do require hormonal therapy. So again, what are the risks? Are we putting you at higher risk of clotting because you have sickle cell disease and we're giving you these hormones? Or are we putting you at higher risk of having more bone disease because you have sickle cell disease and we're also giving you um, hormones? Um, I think we still need to learn a lot more about um, what doses of hormones we use for this purpose and how that affects sickle cell disease. But I think you should still, if you're in that scenario, you should still be able to have those conversations with your doctor, learn the risks and benefits and make the best options for yourself. Um, but that's something that has really not been studied much yet. Um, all right. So let's say that you are one of those persons with sickle cell disease that actually their ovaries are not working well or their sperm quality got affected. What can we do to help you? Or what are the options that exist out there that you can go to or explore if you're trying to have a child and you're not being able to or you have concerns about well i, I don't want to do that because my pregnancy might be too risky like what are the options out there um well we know that in, in countries like this where there's high incomes um fertility options could be available but depending on where you live in the world that might be a lot different um there's some insurance barrier to this some insurance might cover this some others might not um so i know there's a lot of um factors that are gonna play in this and and, and, and are gonna be limited to if you can act, get access to those but i just want to teach you what's out there and what can you ask about and, and what can you explore okay um so remember I told you in girls, the ovaries might not have the right amount of eggs. Um, well, in theory, we can test that, but that's usually not a test that you can go to the doctor and ask for, unfortunately. Um, so still, we don't, we don't know how to quantify that or how to give you a number for you. Yes, do you still have 50% of eggs or not? Like that's not a test that you can ask for, but there are options for fertility. So you can, an option that exists, and again, for all of this, you need to meet with your provider, talk about what are the risks, what are the benefits, if you can do this. Um, how it's gonna get covered and in, in, in when should you do that at what that at what age or not what are the risks or not like I, I'm not um, the best person to tell you that but again what is out there what can you ask about so um, one technique is actually taking um, a part of the ovary or just some of the eggs from the ovary or the whole ovary and save it out or like store it in coal, which is the ovarian tissue cryopreservation or the oocyte or embryo preservation. So freeze your eggs, freeze your ovary, freeze the piece of the ovary. And then when you're ready to have a child, use it later. That's an option that exists. Again, a lot more that you need to ask about that. For boys, some options are banking the sperm, right? So getting some of that sperm, saving it, and then utilize it later to have a child. And how to get a little bit of the testicle and save it, just like we do with the ovaries, it's still being investigated. Um, 
But another option, maybe that might fit you better, could be in vitro fertilization. And that is when we take your eggs and we take the sperm and then we combine them together outside of your body and then implant it in your uterus. Um, and there's other options like just injecting the sperm. If the problem, maybe it's that the sperm of your partner or, or yours, it's, it's not with the best quality. Maybe we, can, we just need to bring that sperm inside in a different way. Um, so again, depending on what your particular challenge might be, this might apply to you or not. How about if you are a person that um, unfortunately lost the eggs or the production of eggs, you, you don't have that anymore, or it's a male who's the sperm really is not working, maybe then you need to find a sperm donor or an egg donor. Those are things that are available. Um, how about um, if you did fertilization in vitro and, and, and your goal is to, yes, you want to have children, but you want to have children that actually have sickle cell disease also, those embryos can get tested. And that's what the pre-implantation genetic diagnosis means. They can test those eggs. And, and, and if you have more than one, test those eggs and find if there's one of them or that doesn't have sickle cell disease, and maybe you can choose that or not. So there's that's, again, something that exists out there. Um, and of course, if you still struggle with many challenges, then should you consider adoption instead? Do you think pregnancy might be too risky for you or you are not have access to those options um, or those options didn't work for you? Maybe consider adoption, consider surrogacy, like a surrogate um, wound. So those are things that I think you should have an idea of that it's out there and explore. How about stem cell transplanted gene therapy? Um, thankfully, we're doing more and more of those nowadays. Well, the challenge with that is we, you know, we need to use chemotherapy to prepare your body for these processes. So chemotherapy could affect your fertility. So again, ask your doctors about, should I be worried about that? What can or should I do before we go through that process? But I think it's worth exploring or asking those questions. Um, so um, again, just to kind of close this, I think any human being has the right um, to enjoy and having the best health possible and fertility can significantly affect your mental health, your physical health, um, your social health as a family, um, as a couple in general. Um, so we have learned from other individuals that have chronic health problems like kids with cancer that now that they're surviving longer they 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 worry a lot about how their fertility is affected so in other diseases like sickle cell disease we should also be taking this um, very into consideration and talking about this um, as a community and, and and as you know from a health perspective um, we should, as doctors, be able to give you better counseling about this. Um, and I hope that that should be more available um, for any patient and anybody that is struggling. Um, so I just want you to use this information to ask questions to your doctor or your child's doctor. Um, talk about it in the community, how we can support each other. Um, and also, if there's an intervention that might fit your particular problem, make sure that you at least explore that and talk about it. Um, if you're pregnant, make sure you have the best care possible for yourself. And if you don't want to get pregnant, make sure you protect yourself the best way possible to prevent that from happening. Um, and as doctors, yes, we need to talk a lot more about it. Um, and um, as scientists, we need to learn a lot more about this, um, and hopefully we can come up with better ways in multidisciplinary clinics and not in how to help our patients with this. Um, so I'll open up for questions if you have any. Thank you. Yes, we have uh, time enough for, I believe, one of two questions. Um, and remember, you guys, if you have any questions, please put them inside the chat. Um, one of the questions is, can sickle cell disease cause endometriosis? I hope I pronounced that correctly. 
Yes, it did. Um, yes. Not to my knowledge, again, I'm not a gynecologist, uh, but endometriosis is a different type of problem um, that um, I've never seen that because you have sickle cell, you can develop it. Um, I think this just are just two separate things um, and so two separate diseases completely. What I would think though is endometriosis, I know can cause a lot of pain and menstrual type of pain and irregular bleeding. Uh, so again, if you think your menstrual cycles are not well, talk to your provider and let's not just think that it's sickle cell related, maybe you need to explore other things. But if you have sickle cell disease, that should not put your risk of having endometriosis. Okay, thank you. And I believe we have time enough for one more question. Um, this one says, what type of information would you give for an older woman who's not, I'm guessing who's not out of childbearing age yet, um, women who don't have children? So, I would so say, she doesn't have a kid yet. But so she, if you're an adult and you're not in the, um, let, so I'll just say, if you're an adult and you do not want to have a child, make sure you find the best contraceptive method for you. And if having children is not something that interests, make sure if, if you're having menstrual cycles, having pain or not, make sure you take care of your symptoms during your menstrual cycles. Um, and as you age a little later, if you're starting to experience symptoms like menopause type of thing, that maybe your ovaries are not working the best, again, make sure you get evaluated for those things. All right. And that is all the questions we have time enough for. Thank you Thank so you. much, Dr. Nunez. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, Dr. Alvarez. This is Carla Lewis. I have one quick question. At what age should a warrior start seeing a gynecologist in order to, you know, follow up and even if they don't have, you know, seen any, mm -hmm. any issues yet, but what age would, would they start that? Yeah, I don't think that's a standard yet so you might get different answers from different doctors when you ask them but i feel um uh, in my practice what i like to do is um before you start having your menstrual cycles when you're in that age i usually ask the the mother why did you got your menstrual cycles to kind of get a sense of when this child might have hers mm -hmm. and then start talking about it and start talking about um it might come a little later and let's not worry about it. If you started having menstrual cycles, then I'm going to make sure that we're treating your pain. But if your menstrual periods are irregular, then I need help from a gynecologist to help control it. Um, or if now you're telling me you're a little older and you're interested in birth control, I want you to talk to a gynecologist to make sure you get the best education you can um, still as a pediatric age. Um, and I would say if you've not had that yet, any women who's considering to have a child, then you should be talking to a gynecologist about, I want to do this. What are my options? What will be the best for me? Okay. Thank you so much. Great, great presentation. Thank Definitely you. reproductive health is one of um, the topics that um, we, we really have to talk more about. So I appreciate you um, presenting on this. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, now, everyone, we are going to be heading over into our next session. So you are going to exit out of this session, go into the Hoover app, go to Agenda, and look for...